Yeah, g'day and welcome back. I really like lathes, so I bought a third one. This week's video is going to be a bit different. Before I rip this off and replace it with a Linux CNC brain, I'd like to do a little tribute to the geeks. <clears throat> little tribute to the electrical engineers and early computer scientists that created this thing. Now I strongly suspect that this old 1977 controller is dead, but let's have a play with it and find out. You know the Swiss have some pretty darn tenacious uh, guns on their machines, but I'll get it clean. In addition to three phase 400 volt power, this machine also needs some uh, pneumatic pressure. There's quite a few pneumatic systems on it, so yeah, better connect that up. Unfortunately, Switzerland obviously has a different uh, standard of pneumatic connector size than is common here, so I had to replace this. Put a new plug on it. Now while this control cabinet is monstrous, one interesting little feature is this. There's a button here. That swings out, revealing the pneumatics module. One of the guys on one of the German forums repositioned all of this uh, pneumatic hardware down to the bottom of the space and was able to then use this area as his electrical cabinet for his uh, conversion which with modern electronics taking up much less space than the original stuff, that'd be cool to get rid of that big control cabinet. Nice long cable. Right, let's see what's happened, shall we? All right, cool. The computer boots up. I'm guessing that this interface panel initializes in a, like a self-test mode. So you can see that all of the digits are working except one part of the end digits missing. Now if we go into the manual mode, there we can see that the computer is following a command. It seems like quite a logical sort of change in status there, which is good. It sounds like there's a little bit of a air leak in here somewhere, but when I turn the machine on and air pressure is available, the main air valve relay opens, so I guess, I'm guessing that's this one. So that obviously is working. You're supposed to have between four and six bars on the outlet side, I've got about five. And when I shut it off, it closes that valve again. Joe Nicotero made a good comment on the last video. You know, when you think about it, in the mid-70s when this was being designed, personal computing wasn't even a thing. We all take for granted all these computers in our lives today, but back then, the transition from computers being a room-sized device for a university research laboratory or maybe a military research laboratory to this was already a big deal downsizing a computer small enough that you could run it on a machine. Think about the device you're watching this video on. But it could be a phone, could be a laptop, could be a personal computer, maybe a television. Think about what it costs. Even if you're watching this on some high-end video editing, workstation, gaming PC, it's probably not costing you more than two, maybe three thousand bucks for a real expensive one. So the controller is powered by a Data General Corporation Nova, the Data General Novas were pretty much the first of the 16-bit mini computers. According to the wiki, Data General bought this uh, Nova series onto the market in 1969. By the mid to late 70s, the price had probably come down a bit, but 
you know, it's still an awful lot of money. It's pretty interesting the way that uh, Shelblin integrated this. You've got a, a rack here with the actual data general Nova computer, and then Shelblin has added their own boards above, beside, to the back, and to the front. It appears that this was the Shelblin internal project number 126, because 126 kind of shows up everywhere. So the whole computer pulls out on its rack. Here it goes, green, yellow, white, brown. I don't even need to note those. These numbers on the wire correspond to numbers on the circuit board. There's a little thicket of ribbon cables to dual inline connectors here, but they've all been marked. I guess these are going to be easy enough to put back together. It's not much support for that circuit board. It seems to be flopping around a bit. So what we're looking at here is the backplane board of the Nova mini computer. Although the printed circuit board had pretty much won the day by this stage, there were obviously still diehards at Data General who kept the option of wire wrap pins available. So this is basically an expansion port across here. So the Nova as a computer had a backplane and then four slots. There's the backplane back there. The top slot has got this uh, Shoblin card in it. The second slot's got one of the data general cards. The third slot is empty. And the fourth slot at the bottom, I think, is the central processing unit. You know, when we think of a CPU today, it's some like quite big chip with maybe 40 billion circuits in it, about this size. Well, on this computer, the central processing unit is 15 inches by 15 inches with a whole bunch of individual ICs, this big array of DIL 16 ICs. So if this is the computer, and that's the actual computing part, I guess this bottom stuff is all just power preparation. It's probably a whole bunch of uh, capacitors and transformers and stuff down in that area. Meanwhile, I'd like to express my gratitude to Nikolai up at Nikolai Owns. I guess he switched over to a Renishaw probe and very generously donated his, uh, his old Hyma 3D probe to me, which I really appreciate. And this is beautiful. It's going to make touching off on the Maho much quicker. So thanks, Nikolai. So how do we actually program this? Looks like when we first turn it on, it goes into a lamp test mode. Now, if you were actually going to... Oh, wow, I've got a whole bunch of error messages now, which I've never seen before. That's interesting. Unfortunately, I don't have an error code uh, manual, so I really don't know what this is trying to tell me. Let's quickly look through the, the modes of this thing. If you were just turning the machine on for the first time, this would be where you'd start. RE means reference. So you click that. I guess push start and the machine should head off and do its normal referencing. The referencing's done by moving over the Hall Effect target, where it moves from ferrous to non-ferrous metal, and also, I believe, in combination with the rotational position of the resolver. Anyway, so once you've referenced the thing, the next thing you can do is use the PX and PZ to set your X and Z offset coordinates, like for the end of a piece of metal, Next mode, once you've done that, set your offsets, is manual mode. But now we should be able to jog the machine around using the joystick. It's kind of floppy feeling. There's definitely a gate inside there, but I'm not sure if it's broken or it's supposed to feel like that. With the switch, you're selecting your jog speed. The slowest is 10 millimeters per minute, 25, 50, I think 400. And this one, it goes 1200 on the Z and 600 on X. This switch gives you a manual turn of your tool carousel. The next thing we have here is the SA mode. This is used like an MDI on a modern CNC for manual direct input. What you'll do is set a, a single line of code, right? We start up here with a, just giving it a line number. In this case, let's call it line number one. This here determines the lower program. It's kind of similar to a modern G-code, where today we would say G0 for a rapid move, 
G1 for a feed rate move, G2 for a curve clockwise, G3 curves anti-clockwise. Here we've got about 90 geometric programs to do various things like internal threading, external threading. So we'd set what we want it to do. Let's say 03 is an angular feed rate move, just for sake of argument. This field sets the target X position, either positive or negative, millimeters and decimals. You can set it in 10 micron steps. And also you can choose between absolute positioning or relative positioning. And exactly the same thing is used for the Z. Moving now to the second line, this is our feed rate. Looking at it, you've got a choice of either doing a feed rate move or a thread. If you're in uh, millimeter mode, your options are anything from one micron per revolution down here, all the way through to 99999, so roughly 10 millimeters pitch. An inch, you can only select between three threads per inch, up as high as 99 threads per inch. This is the tool carousel. You can select only tools one, two, three, or four for the four positions of the carousel. It also gives you the option of an A and a B tool at each position. And that corresponds with the tool in the dovetail or the shaft mounted tool. In our next position, we're looking at the spindle, either clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation. But the speed selector is actually pretty clever. Starting at zero, zero, it means spindle stopped for this operation. Then you've got the spindle sp speeds between one and 38, giving you discrete speeds between 48 RPM and 3000. Although it's got a variator and therefore variable speed, it doesn't allow you to, to choose an infinite number of speeds. You have to set them in one of these 37 steps. But here it gets cool. Once you go to 50, you then move on to surface speed setting, where 50 will give you eight meters per minute, and 91, I think, is the highest, takes you up to 900 meters per minute. That's a, kind of the equivalent of what we do today with the G96 and G97 commands built into there. Very clever. The next panel gives us a bunch of different selectors. First up, are we using collets or chucking from the inside? Or are we chucking from the outside? And then we have the option of the collet closer being in the open or in the clamped position. Coolant on off. This is the tailstock center, which is pneumatic if you've got the tailstock, either engaged or disengaged. Normally, the spindle brake will be activated automatically. But if you put in the brake open, and have the spindle speed set to zero, then you can turn the chuck by hand. The final switch here is just a spare. Okay, so we've now set our whole line of code and what we want it to do, and then we can hit start, and the machine will run that one line. But that's kind of a clutch, you know, just running one line at a time. What if you want to run a whole program? Well, for that, we go into program mode, do the same thing, starting at line one, Program all of the variables that you want, set all of your different positions of speeds, feeds, coolant, etc. And once you've set everything, hit continue, switch to line two, set everything you need for line two, do all the same thing again. Once again, continue, line three, etc. Once you've finished and you want to tell the machine that you've done the whole program, that's when you hit the memory button which saves that program into the volatile memory of the computer. Now at that point, you now have the option of verifying the program with the VI button. In the VI mode, each time you hit continuous, it'll just step through a line one after the other to show you what's in that whole program. You can also add lines or subtract lines with this AI mode but I really don't know how that works because it's not really described in the manual I've got. Now you've got a program in there, you want to actually run that program, then you hit the AU for automatic mode, and press start, 
and off the machine goes and does a cycle. And at the end of each cycle, you just have to sit, hit start again. You get to the end of the working day, you've got a program in the volatile memory. If you turn off the machine, it's gone. How do we save it? Well, that's what these two are for. Yep, you guessed it, audio cassette drive. You can store up to 20 programs of 100 lines each on the cassette. How cool is that, huh? And of course, if you can save a program, you can also load a program. That looks like I've got no length working there. I believe all you'd have to do is set the number of the program between 1 and 20. You hit that button and it automatically scans through your tape until it finds the program of that number and loads it. And then, of course, you can go into the verify mode and go through and check it before you run it. It's actually a pretty clever uh, controller and covers pretty much everything that you'd expect from a modern controller for a lathe. Later. I posted a photo of these resolvers to the Linux CNC forum and the guys have pointed out that this is a very old style of resolver which works differently to modern resolvers and therefore modern drives such as the granite drives probably aren't going to support this. By the way, if you're interested in following the uh, build of this on the forum, I'll put a link. To get this running under Linux CNC, it looks like I've probably got four different options. So one would be keep the motors, keep the resolvers, and just work out how to plug into these existing massive drives and reuse them. The second option is probably replace this resolver with an encoder, but keep the motor and use some modern DC drives. And the third option is probably replace the motors and the drive with modern AC servos. So what do you think you would do if this was your machine? So there we have it, the brain that was. I think next week I'm going to try putting some power on some of the stuff and seeing what actually works and what doesn't. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do.